Hello everyone, my name is Dan Armstrong. I'm the Corporate Communications Specialist here at Covenant Eyes, and we have a very special guest this time, uh, Steve uh, Picorni. He is the founder of Freedom Coaching. You can find him at freedom-coaching.net. He's the author of the book, Redeemed Vision. Freedom Coaching is a one-on-one -on -one mentoring system aimed at healing those with an attraction to pornography reclaim a healthy vision of the body and sexuality. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Dan. It's an honor to be here. And uh, talk about um, this um, question that we have posed today. It's, it's very interesting because I think some people don't see the connection here. It's, it's, it's a long question, but uh, I know you'll be able to explain this for us well. You've said that pornography is a drug, intimacy, and vision problem. Could you explain what you mean by that? Sure. So in my work, uh, Redeem Vision, Setting the Blind Free from the Pornified Culture, the way in which to diagnose this issue, because as, as you know very well and, and the viewers know, um, the issue of pornography is huge and affecting all aspects of, uh, of life, you know, from men, women, those in the industry, those who are viewers, children, teenagers, everyone. And because it seems to be so overwhelming, how do we getting our kind of mind around how we can begin to address this is really important. So I, and, and through the work that I do with freedom coaching, um, kind of developed this and kind of saw this, that it's a, it's a kind of a three headed hydra, shall we say, but the, but unlike regular hydras, I think if we do address them, we can actually kill the beast in a certain sense or transform it in a certain sense. So first is, would be that drug problem. And we have a lot of information now that's coming out that this, you know, the issue of pornography and where it's been labeled and painted for so long has been a religious, religious issue. But now we're seeing it as really a mental health and public um, health crisis that's coming out. A lot of, like, the state of Utah, other states are coming out, and uh, I think the state of Florida just recently came out proclaiming this being a public health crisis. And we also see in organizations like Fight the New Drug going into the drug aspects. So what do we mean by that? And I think first and foremost, uh, I, I like to address the issue from the, the notion that we are not, um, it's not an addiction issue. I think we use that label and that the, the term addiction has that, that notion that once hooked, always hooked. We wanna come from the perspective of a compulsion, that there is a problem here, it is serious, and it's a chemical compulsion, meaning the chemicals in the brain that are stirred up in say a healthy marriage and healthy intimacy, um, such as dopamine, norepinephrine, estrogen, testosterone, um, those different chemicals are stood up in the brain in healthy marriage, and those same chemicals are stirred up when we view pornography. But what ends up happening is what should, have, should be bringing us joy and completion and peace and union with another person. Instead, we end up very fragmented. We end up very much involved in, in this great guilt and shame that comes in, and we aren't sure what to do with that. And the good news is just knowing about these chemicals can put a light bulb in people's heads and in their hearts to realize, okay, maybe this is a serious issue. Maybe this is something I need to deal with, something I need to go about and get help for. So that would be the first thing we've gotta go and recognize that. Second aspect would be an intimacy issue. And what do we mean by this? A phrase that's been said by a couple speakers, intimacy defining it into me see. Um, to see me for me, and to love me for me, and then obviously reciprocating that to other people. So in those who are seeking out pornography, and, and there is a genuine need that they're wanting to, to, to have, fed, have filled there, right? There's a desire for um, communion with others. There's a desire for not just beyond, not just pleasure, but a, a great need for, for that love that they're yearning for so much so, so that they are seeking it in an improper way. So we're trading true forms of intimacy with false forms. And what, why is this happening? Well, as, as many of those who are watching this can attest, have experienced a breakdown in the family, a breakdown from their own, the way which they were raised from their father or mother, either which they, they were treated being raised, or maybe there was absence. Maybe there was a, something, um, you know, pa their parents just weren't there. They didn't provide for them, whether physically and or emotionally. And so this great need for connection, this great need to become a part of something, like when we're talking, especially when I speak to youth um, very frequently, um, the great need right now that we're seeing is this lack, this desire to be liked, this desire to belong and finding they can't. And so when, when those desires that are natural good desires become what we can say eroticized, 
we go seeking out that desire for genuine relationship in an improper way because pornography itself will never satisfy as has been said the problem with pornography is not that it shows too much that shows too little we can never really get what we're really looking for so we've got to recognize that we've got an issue of how can i go attain genuine intimacy in a way that will actually fulfill me because i like to use the analogy that the issue of pornography is like a septic tank that we are trying to attain a genuine desire for the, the to quench this, this this thirst for love in a way that will never quench it right pornography can never do that and we and many times we get caught in this pattern of using and using and using that we think okay this time i'll be satisfied Okay, no, this time. Then we feel a guilt and shame. This time, instead we find ourselves trapped and then we don't know how to actually go about and have that satisfied. But we, the good news is, is that really we were created to have the desire for love, for intimacy, for genuine friendship actually to be satisfied. So that would be the second issue in a obviously broad scope. And the third issue that I think we're just not talking about, very few people have talked about, is that this is a vision problem. And to elaborate uh, or to bring this out um, in, a, in a way to start the conversation is a, a story that I bring up in my book, Redeem Vision, where you've got uh, a young boy. Uh, this is a true story, somebody I know. Um, he, was out, um, he was out at a picnic with his, his family, and uh, he came upon a, he was at a park, came upon a quote unquote gentleman's club. Okay? It was a, a, an ad advertisement with two topless women. And he immediately went to his, um, his older sister and said, I found a yucky picture. And then he went to his older, uh, she said, go to your older brother, go tell him about it. So he did. The older brother said, tell me, show me where you found this. He did. And the older brother found it, ripped it up immediately and threw it away and said, you don't need to go looking for it. Two questions come from this. A, how did the younger brother immediately go and throw that away or go, go and tell his, his younger sister or older sister and then her his older brother by extension, and then B, how did the older brother go and rip that up and throw it away? Well, the answer lies in the fact that this is a family that grew up with a lived experience of learning how to see the body. Because in the church, the wider church, we've got this notion that because so many of us have, shall we say, tasted the forbidden fruit of lust, we have associated that lust with the body, that the body is the problem that it just looking at the bo body is inevitably going to lead us to lust. And this is where a lot of people feel that the best they can hope for when they get trapped in this vicious cycle of compulsion is coping mechanisms, right? I thank God for the work you guys are doing at Covenant Eyes. It's really important, that accountability. Nobody's gonna break free from this for a, a vast majority of people on their own. We certainly are not gonna break free from this on our own willpower, so accountability is certainly a part of this. But if, we, if we're if we at the point of saying, I can only use a computer in when I've got accountability so, software in a public place, then I think we've got to have a deeper discussion on what is genuine freedom. Because freedom is is not in mere external, um, external uh, keeping hindrances, but it should be from the interior that I desire to, to choose, desire to pursue what is true, good, and beautiful. And this freedom is going to start with our vision. So go back to that young, that young boy they, uh, in, in this whole thing, because um, our experience, for those who have had an experience with pornography, and I was there, like the movie 12 Years a Slave, I was 12 years a slave mm. with pornography. Mm. And thinking, I will never be free from this. I can never be done with this. Well, God had other plans. And from this perspective, it is when, when for, for those of us who have started with pornography use, um, we experience, you know, we, we see that image, you know, obviously a lot of this has gone digital because of the internet, but you know, older days it was, it was magazines and things like that. If we found one of those, in, those images, what would we want to do? We want to hide it. So like we might set up on our browser, we might set up a secret file of images, you know, and, and it looks like, you know, it's uh, crocheting, you know, nobody's going to want to go into crocheting, <laughs> right? Uh, well, there's cro what guys go crocheting, but for whatever, for this example, and for here, we um we want to hide this why because we're viewing it like buried treasure and here's where the flip has to come in the problem is not the body the problem is not sexuality the problem is not attraction the problem is not nakedness 
The problem is lust. Mm. And here's the deal. God created us with eyes to see. Yes, men are visual, but women are visual also. And we've been given eyes to actually see the body for who and what the body is. And here's the, here's the takeaway, Dan, that when we can actually learn how to see the body, guess what happens? The attraction to lust ceases. Mm. You're actually able to transform the desire, not to the place where we don't have any sexual desire at all. No, but it becomes properly integrated into us because our world says we've got two options when we're dealing with, you know, you know, dealing with lust. Either you go, you stuff it, or, you know, you can, you can only stuff it long, long enough because this is literally the power that brings forth life. It, it be, leads to explosion. And for those who have experienced a breakdown in that desire, know that what's on the other side of that indulgence is guilt and shame. This self-hatred goes so deep. When we feel as though, I'm trapped, I'll never be free, my life is not worth living here. And this is where the great despair comes in. But I tell those to fear not, because the third option here is real, and it's called integration, where we integrate those desires in a way through our vision so that we can see a person for who it is. Because here's another takeaway from this. If we've been programmed, and this is literally the, with the chemical compul compulsion, what pornography is doing is programming us we're talking about visual pornography because it can be auditorial or written in fact, but if it's programmed us to see a person in a certain way, well, let's flip it around. What if we've been programmed, you know, to think that it's a certain body type, right? Well, what about those in real life that don't have those body types? Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, a lot of those on this, on this, on this uh, webinar today are, are Christians, right? Well, we're not called to disregard anyone. And this is what we would say is the root of the opposite of love is really apathy of using another person and then disregarding them. So even if a person looks like somebody who is not a model, could never be on the cover of, uh, of Sports Illustrated or Maxim or whatever, how are we seeing that person? So it's got, and, and then flip it around, what about those that we have been programmed and attracted to? Can we actually look them in the eye and see them as persons, not a collection of body parts? And this is the bold proposal that I'm saying here, that if we do not deal with the vision part of this, then there cannot be genuine internal freedom. Wow, that's, that's compelling. That was, uh, that was very well done and very, very clear. Um, I, I find that interesting um, that uh, the middle component, intimacy, is interesting because many people would think those who um, are trying to get away from people, are trying to get back to their phone by themselves, trying to get back to their computer by themselves, trying to get somewhere where, you know, I don't want to see any human beings and I want to experience pornography all alone, all by myself. They're still seeking. It's not that they're not, they're trying to fill that intimacy void with something else and rather than human beings, it's something else, but they still have that need for intimacy. I found that really interesting that uh, mm -hmm. you explained it that way where we were made to be with other people. We were not ever meant to be alone or left alone, um, but yet we'll try to seek intimacy with something else and fill it with something else. I mean, even building up on that, Dan, like ask that question, right? When do most people watch pornography? When they're alone? Well, think about what are they, what are they watching? They're, they're watching, you know, something that usually it's actors acting out the sexual act, mm -hmm. okay? And, and, and I would even argue it's not the sexual act at all. Mm -hmm. Lust is so far from the sexual act that you can possibly imagine. Actually, ask anybody who is striving to live a healthy marriage, right? It's far and few between. I, I mean, I think uh, there's a speaker on uh, who speaks on chastity, Jason Ever Everett. Some of those who are watching this are familiar with it. You know, he says, he used the example, you know, ten tonight, 10 o'clock, go over to your neighbor's house and look over, right? Hey, what are you doing <laughs> there, right? <laughs> People are like, okay, you're creeping me out. Right. Call the cops. Sure. And so many of us are doing this in our private viewing times. Why? Well, because we're trying to meet again that genuine desire. So I want to just encourage those who are dealing with this struggle: don't be afraid of that desire, but don't stop at the surface. Because we think, okay, I feel this. This is where this must be my fulfillment. No, when we hit that fear level, don't stop. Go to where it actually can be fulfilled. And it really can. And we got to, though, learn how to see. That's amazing because we can have a whole conversation on what pornography is doing to people, what is going on when people are experiencing pornography, how to 
uh, protect yourself from pornography, how to recover from this, but yet all of that discussion has very little to do with pornography. That's such an interesting thing that all of these things that pornography creates can be solved without even looking at pornography as as the thing that we need to either get rid of, but there's so many other things going on internally that um, I think people are, are flabbergasted to think, wow, you know what? As a parent, a good parenting will keep my child from having issues. Uh, a good marriage, a good accountability network will keep me from pornography. And I don't have to talk much about the pornography itself because that's just what we're using to salve ourselves or to fill in or to artificially uh, try to satisfy us when we realize it's not satisfying us. And I would add, I would add to that. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, I think a lot of people, the, the issue of pornography is so big and we're talking about how do we deal with pornography? But if there's a genuine need here, when we meet the genuine need, which is the genuine need for community, the genuine need to see others, to be seen. I think there's a lot of people who just are not being seen, are not being appreciated for who they are. When we can strive to actually meet that genuine need, guess what? The counterfeit loses its power. We no longer desire what is not true, good, and beautiful. Why? Because we're made for the truth. God created us for way more. But most of us, we settle. We settle because we're comfortable here and we think I've got this thing here. Okay, let's let's be let's take the issue at hand. I got this pornography here. And if I give this up, then I'll have nothing. Mm. And it's better to at least have something where I'm at least uh, at least it's tolerably miserable to having nothing and I'll be alone. But the good news is God wants to fill that. He wants to fill that deepest desire in a way that we can't possibly imagine, especially if we're holding on so tightly. So will we say yes? Will we let go and let him love us? That's the intimacy part, especially because ultimately genuine intimacy is going to come from him. And then taking that to have our hearts transformed, our minds renewed, so we can go and love others in a way that we were looking for in the first place. I find that interesting that uh, from a parental perspective, I think oftentimes kids may think of that where mom and dad aren't giving me the information that I need when it comes to sexuality. So rather than having nothing, which uh, unfortunately we do sometimes and leave, leave a void, they grab onto something that maybe a cousin or an older sibling are talking about or may experience pictures or videos because without this, I don't know anything. So uh, I think that's a, that's a very good illustration of where people are often coming from, whether child or adult, where they feel, at least I have something, at least this fool's gold gives the impression that there's value rather than having nothing. Yeah, and I would say, in, uh, building upon that, you know, this is where I would encourage parents out there. You know, in addition to getting, to getting my book, I, the book is very practical, especially for parents, uh, the last chapter of the book of Redeemed Vision, um, is, is really confronting what are your own dem demons, right? Because so many of us, I, I think every single person on the planet right now has been affected by the pornified culture, culture that is using people as a means of our sexual uh, sexual gratification. Mm -hmm. We've all either we've done it or we've, we've experienced that the, the whole Me Too culture that's out there that is affecting countless people. But I think it's a really good that we're talking about it, but very few people are proposing genuine genuine answers to this. And this is, I believe, a major answer to the piece mm -hmm. on this. If it's the only answer, well, then praise God. I don't think it is. Um, but we are saying here that, you know, that teaching our children how to see the body is going to be very important because when they are confronted with the real deal, because the body itself was created good and we're created to see, then when the counterfeit is, is proposed to us, and like your, your kids, you're watching a cartoon, right? And there's a, there's some innuendo that goes in. Yes, there's, this is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Then we can, we don't have to go, okay, cover your eyes. Instead say, let's pause it. Mm -hmm. What's actually there? Is this actually a true representation of the body or is there a counterfeit? What's the counterfeit? Have engaging in dialogue. So, cause I mean, Dan, I don't know about you, but you and, uh, but I grew up, you know, I think I was doing a quote unquote dirty mad lips. Mm -hmm. I got busted by my mom and she's <laughs> like, um, so, so tell me what you know about, uh, what do you know about sex? Yeah. A lot. That was my answer. <laughs> was the and again, I, I, I'm not here to fault my mom, but sure, if she sure. would have given me a glimmer mm -hmm. of this beautiful vision for God's plan for the body mm -hmm. and sexuality and how to see it, oh my gosh. But again, mm -hmm. God can write straight with crooked lines. Yeah. Um, and the lines that we think are straight, he can make crooked to where we need to get to. 
Um, so as an encouragement to those who are looking for answers, you know, whether in your church or whether parents, there are genuine answers here. We do not need to despair. There is hope here. And learning how to see needs to be a major part of the work you're doing. Accountability is very important. But again, it's also when, you know, say somebody stumbles into that website, what do you do with it? Do you harass them? Do you beat down them? No. Let's talk about what were you actually looking for there? And let's present a genuine beauty because it's beauty that we're looking for. And beauty blows pornography out of the water because mm. pornography is so far from beauty and then, uh, that it actually becomes nauseating and actually a sadness comes over us when we've been um, baptized into beauty. Who would be uh, ideal uh, audience for Freedom Coaching where you work and what can people do to get a hold of you? Sure, so with Freedom Coaching, again, we started this in 2011 and I say we because there's a team here. My, my wife uh, supports in the background um, and, and we are developing other coaches. That, that is the game plan. Um, this is for anybody who experiences an attraction or, or what we call compulsion pornography, somebody who can't break free. I've worked with those in their 60s. I've worked with women. I've worked with a, a child as young as eight years old. Mm. Okay. And as we know, the average age of exposure is between eight and, eight and 11 years of age. In my book, I talk about a boy who was exposed at year five and how that was um, affecting a neighborhood girl. So we know this is a big deal. We know it's not just going to go away. We've got to be proactive, um, but there are genuine answers here. So I, I, I will work with them on a one-on-one -on -one case basis to help to break that attraction, but even more so to transform it so that when those pornified images are presented, um, they're like mosquitoes. They're annoying mosquitoes that, okay, and I can see the truth, and I'm going to desire and follow what is, what's actually going to satisfy. Gotcha. So we will link to uh, both the Freedom Coaching website as well as how you can uh, order Steve's book as well in the comment section here. Steve, uh, we could talk all day. I've been enjoying this conversation. You provided so much value. Uh, thank you so much for being with us this time, and uh, we we'll look forward to uh, talking to you later. Awesome, Dan. Thank you very much for the honor.